Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, Ad Nauseam listeners, to episode 37. As always, my name is David Noe. I'm here in the Vomitorium with my good but fair weather friend, Dr. Jeff Winkle. I'm doing great, by the way. Yeah, how are you doing, Jeff? I- I'm, doing, I'm doing just fine. Good. So I, that, that sounded negative. I'm actually doing really well. Excellent. And fair weather, as you described me. Well, it's yeah. not because your friendship is intermittent or unreliable. But it's because now we have such glorious summer weather here in Michigan. The weather is actually fair. It's great. Yeah. 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 So I had uh, briefly made you wait outside. Briefly. I I was waiting a while, but it was okay. To get into the vomitorium. Right. But it was okay because the wind was rustling through the reeds. The swans were gliding across the the lake. I heard some bullfrogs. Wow. It was very... You're going to wax poetic on us? It was an amoinous locus. Nice. Yes. Was there any... um, You just missed my nice reference about waxing poetic. Oh, I'm done now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Was there any secret danger lurking in that place of idyllic calm? Well, there's the the thing that looks like a crocodile. That's crazy, isn't it? It is creepy, yeah. Right outside, you're going to want to hear this, listener, so don't (laughs) don't mute the volume or continue on with your jogging. Right. (laughs) Right outside the vomitorium here is a partial submerged log which has knobby little protuberances sticking up above the water they look like the eyes of a crocodile it's uncanny it really and is. unsettling yes. yes yeah it would be a strange occurrence of a freshwater crocodile in a very small geographical location right although i was just reading an article about alligators getting loose in northern michigan no way yes. Find, finding their way north or and then if people keeping them. What as do pets. they hitchhike or <laughs> exactly. and, uh, up up 131? And right. that's how they get here. <laughs> right. But alligators are fresh water, so the, you know, the crocodile. I mean, that would be. I am revealing my ignorance. Okay. I... Well, the moral of the story, listener, is that this podcasting excursion is dangerous. It is dangerous. We have to walk past the crocodile. But what are we talking about today? Uh, we're talking about Sallust. Sallust. Yes. All right. So a literary archaeology mm-hmm. of Roman history. This is uh, a, a short. Uh, section from his Bellum Catalinae. Correct. And Chapters 6 through 13. Where he basically takes us from the beginnings of Roman history all the way up to his present. Yes, and he does so with great rapidity, uh, style, and I would say a lot of psychological interest. I, I agree. And also a little annoying. You find him annoying? We'll, 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 get, we'll get to it, but yes, I do. And okay. I, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll say why. Yeah. All right. Well, I have to give the shout out today. Yeah. And this one is a real pleasure. It goes to our new friend, Mr. Robert Weathers. Mr. Robert Weathers. Uh, What do we know about Mr. Weathers? Well, it's very interesting. He might be one of the most fascinating individuals thus far uh, who has emailed us at the Ad Nauseam Studios. That's a high bar to clear. It is, yeah. So he works at Colonial Williamsburg, and he is a Ah. historical interpreter. He portrays people from the 18th century. This is fascinating. So he specifically interprets George Wythe, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, a tutor of Thomas Jefferson and many other notables of the revolution. And he was the first professor of law in North America. Wow. So if you're looking to blame someone for the proliferation of lawyers, (laughs) this is the guy. This is the guy. (laughs) So he holds uh, public audiences and he discusses various 18th century matters uh, centered around law, natural, moral, philosophy, and so forth, dressed in complete uh, period garb. And then he, you know, he's a a professional actor, Colonial Williamsburg, portraying uh, this tutor and teacher of so many of the founding fathers what what a great job yes is it that, that's a, that's fascinating that's, yeah and this is not like slapping on a mascot costume at disneyland There's no 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 all no. kinds of research has to go into this oh yes. yes i mean he goes deep in i understand he goes deep into the intellectual philosophical background of these individuals yeah. and he's got to give not just you know persuasive and convincing answers but ones that are historically accurate accurate that's amazing yeah well wow. and uh, apparently he has a uh, a colleague who uh portrays george mason also a fan of the podcast excellent man maybe so, maybe worthy of another shout out down the line i think so okay. yeah maybe we could even have him on the show that'll and be, that'll uh, be fabulous so thank yeah. you so much robert for listening and uh, we really appreciate it now jeff yes i think you have our opening quote is that right yes this comes from um the great gb conti 
uh, from his book Latin Literature, um, 1987, uh, writing about Sallust. Sallust was a school author and one of the most popular writers of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. He appears frequently in catalogs of libraries starting in the 11th century, and more than 500 manuscripts have survived, including two from the 9th century, four from the 10th century, and 330 from the 15th century. 330. That's, that's amazing. So he is very well represented. Yeah, he really yeah. peaked in the 1400s. Yeah. Amazing. The medieval manuscripts followed two families, an earlier Carolingian and French one, a later German one. In the early Renaissance, he exercised an enormous influence upon humanist historiography, especially upon Leonardo Bruni's historical writing and political thought, and upon Politian's account of the Pazzi conspiracy. The Pazzi conspiracy? Yeah. Apparently this is a conspiracy to assassinate uh, Lorenzo the Great. So this has nothing to do with Happy Days and Anson oh, Williams? I wish it did, right? <laughs> Uh, there are many, there are many uh, conspiracies that want to get rid of that guy, too. Yeah, I think well, he's still a working actor, so just, just go easy now. You've seen Anson Williams in something recently? Well, maybe he's a working director. Okay, all right. All right. So the Pazzi conspiracy, we should just say uh, something about this very briefly. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a little bit of research. 20, yeah. 26 April 1478, an attempt, as you mentioned, to assassinate Lorenzo de' Medici, Il Magnifico, and his brother Giuliano. Take them both out. Take them both out. Yeah. Who would want to kill that guy? Well, a rival, rival families. You I know, suppose. Jockeying for position in, in medieval, in, a, in Renaissance Florence. But look at all he did for the city of Florence. Fantastic yes. accomplishments. The artists he patronized and so forth. Yeah. I'm, uh, glad, I'm glad he survived. Oh, oh I am too. Right, yeah. Right. A, yeah. So the Pazzi conspiracy, the telling of it by Politian, was modeled on Sallust. So he, he oh, continued okay. to have, you know, the, the history of the account was modeled on the Bellum Catalinae. Right. So Sallust continued to have all kinds of resonance and influence up into the uh, 16th century. Maybe this is getting ahead of things, but do you have a sense of why was Sallust so popular in the Renaissance? Well, I think it's in part because the uniqueness of his style, it's very anti-Ciceronian. We'll mm. talk about that a little bit. The okay. style is so brittle and sharp, but also the development of the concept of a monograph. Okay. So we're going to have to talk about monographs during uh, this episode quite a bit. Not the spirograph. Oh, I where love you, the spirograph. <laughs> where you, calm down now, Winkle. Don't get too enthusiastic. <laughs> where you take the colored pens and the yeah. little geometric shapes and you squiggle. That's the spirograph. Oh, we're not talking about that? No, 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 okay. no, no. We're going to talk about the monograph okay. Okay. today. Okay, all right. So what is it exactly that we're going to give our listeners, Dr. Winkle? Well, today we're going to zero in on one brief but thrilling and philosophically evocative aspect of Roman historiography, namely the literary archaeology of Roman history given us by Sallust in sections 6 through 13 of his uh, Bellum Catalina, Catiline's yeah. War. Yeah, Catiline's War, the Bellum Catalina. So it's not really the war against Catiline, right? Because that, that would be something else. Right. I think the title, oh, yeah. I think the title means the war that Catiline owns, ah. right? the one that is his. So that's a very carefully chosen title. Well, we don't, we don't know if Sals gave it this title, do we? Uh, or, no, right? that's true. But I mean, that's, that's a, I think that's a really important distinction to make. It's, it's not a against Catiline, no. right? No, right. because that would be something along the lines of Cicero's famous set of four speeches, right? right? In Catalinam. Right. This is uh, Catiline's attempt to overthrow the whole system. Yeah. So as we get into it then, mm -hmm. we need to talk a little bit about the vita, the life, and the opera and works of uh, our man Salas. What do we know? Uh, walk us through this. Yeah, so we're going to rely here, once again, on jean Conte, oh, the, nice. the wonderful... It, Fairly nicely done. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the wonderful Italian historian of uh, Latin literature. This is a brilliant book, by the way. Both of us read it in grad school. Yes, we were forced to prepare for a qualifying exam. Correct. But it was one of those... Uh, the, it was, for me, it was one of those cases where I thought, this is, this is great. It was delightful. Right. Yeah, so written in Italian, translated by, I think, a guy named Joseph Salado and uh, published by Johns Hopkins. So he has uh, each one of these authors from the really well-known Sallust to the relatively obscure and late, each of them gets an entry. So yeah. it's like an encyclopedia. In fact, it's not a monograph. It, it is an encyclopedia, yeah. but there's so much interest in detail. It's written brilliantly. So Gaius Salustius Crispus, this is uh, quoting here from Conte, was born at Amaternum in the Sabine Territory. Today it's near L'Aquila. So uh, the Sabine Territory, south and mostly east of Rome. That's my sense too. If yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yep. He was born around 86 of a wealthy family, 
but this family had never given any magistrates to the state. So in other words, he was a... He was a new man. That's right. He was a novus homo, yep. like uh, two other well-known, uh, what would it be, novi homines. Yes. One would be Marius, uh, and another is Cicero, Cicero himself. Cicero himself, right, exactly. So what's really interesting uh, about this, I think, is that oftentimes the Bellum Catalinae is read as a diatribe against Cicero, Hmm. And uh, we'll talk about that just briefly, because th- this episode's not about the work as a whole, but about the seven chapters of yes. the archaeology. But nevertheless, Sallust and Cicero, though they ended up on opposite sides of the, the Civil War, they have some real um, important similarities, this being the first one, the Novus Homo. Okay, okay. Uh, it was also the, the origin, the region of the famous Cato the Censor, Cato the Elder, the crotchety old fellow from yes. the previous century who apparently ended every speech with Cartagonum esse de lendum. Right. right. Carthage has to be destroyed. Yes, right, right, right. Uh, which I find kind of charming, frankly. <laughs> Not the destruction of Carthage, but the tenacity. Exactly. And that was his hook. Everybody, exactly. Everybody was waiting for it, right? <laughs> you know? Is he going to say it? Of course right. he's going to say it. So, you know, he'd get up and he's debating some, you know, sewer bill. We need to extend uh, sewer, you know, 45 from the Aquiline to, the, I'm just making things up, yeah. to, to the Esquiline Hill. And it needs to be rerouted past the butcher shop. Oh, and by the way... By the way. <laughs> Carthage must, must be, be destroyed. destroyed. <laughs> he went on and on like this. Yeah. Uh, and of course, poor Cato, I believe he died um, 150, 149, just a couple years before the third Carthaginian war started, mm. you know, 149 to 146. So he never got to see his hopes realized. Oh my gosh. That, that is tragic. Uh, imagine the disappointment. Yeah. 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 So he was a fellow Sabine. Um, Sallust and Cato were from the same region. And uh, Conti tells us that Cato the Censor was an important ideological and literary model for Sallust. Okay, okay. Studied in Rome. Uh, apparently he became quaestor in 55 or 54. Now, I'm sure the listener, as um, well-educated as she is, knows that a quaestor is a basically a financial position in the Roman government. Oh, it sounded like a really a dull job. I would think so. Yeah. Yes, but I, it's a step on the way correct. to political greatness. Yes. And if you're a, a person with ambition and skill, I'm not sure you had to actually do a lot of the work yourself. I think it might have been titular. So mm. you become quaestor, and it's your job to make sure the army gets the bread and the supplies it needs. But you probably have a whole office of subordinates that you know, do that kind of thing. And then they just deliver it to you and say, here, you know, yeah, sign off on this. Right. And then you're done. Right. And then on to the next uh, lung, uh, rung on the ladder. Correct. Yes. Yeah. The cursus honorum. Yep. So early on, he was a popularis, right? Yeah. I thought that was interesting. Is that, um, that it, it, where, where is that coming from? Is it because he's kind of an outsider? Um, we, he, we know that he, he also, he throws his lot in with Caesar. Correct. And Caesar uh, was very popular with, yes. the, with the peoples. Yes, and aligned himself with that side. Yeah. Uh, it's partly speculative, but my impression is that at this time, if you were a young man of ambition, you saw an individual like Caesar, and um, the populist party had a tremendous amount of appeal. I mean, Sallust himself describes in the Bellum Catalinae um, how so many young men of talent and nobility were drawn to Catiline in part because of a little bit of boredom and a sense of exclusion from the highest uh, levels of politics. Oh, okay. So it's a little bit of a reaction against those aristocrats who are, uh, apparently it's called log rolling. Have you heard this term? I have not. It's a new one for me. Log rolling is when, uh, it's used in academia sometimes, when um, people get in charge, uh, a small group get in charge, an oligarchy, and then they really just flatter and compliment and provide each other with opportunities um, and keep other people out by being an exclusive club. I see. I, I, I always associate log rolling with falling into the water. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how the term, <laughs> well, the term arose. Goes, but that's what it is. So, yes. so being a popularis is a kind of a way of sticking it to the man. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And so early on, the sources tell us, Sallust was a part of this group. And of course, he was uh, here relying on Conte as well. Um, he led a campaign against Clodius's killer Milo. Mm. You remember the Pro Milona? Of course. Right? Cicero's Pro Milona. Uh, he defends Milo on a charge of murder against Clodius. And Clodius was one of these blue bloods, uh, an aristocrat like Catiline, who was actually um, a populist, yeah. part of the populares. And so this brought him into conflict with uh, Cicero as well. That okay. is, brought Sallust into conflict 
with Cicero. So he's coming up right up in, to my mind, arguably one of the most interesting Definitely. periods in, in uh, or most volatile periods in Roman history. Correct. And he's as, in the thick uh, of it. Yes. And as Ed Watts told us uh, in Mortal Republic, I don't know how many weeks ago that was, I can't remember the episode number, uh, but it was Watts's, it is Watts's thesis that this was the time when the whole thing could have actually fallen apart completely. Right. That's a, right, exactly right. Yeah. The dissolution of the Republic altogether. Mm-hmm. So then the, um, the Civil War breaks out, right, in 49. Uh, but right before that, uh, apparently Sallust fell afoul of uh, the aristocrats. And he got kicked out of the Senate for moral turpitude. We, and we don't know really the backstory, right? It, there's mystery about what exactly, what was the charge, if it was... I think he left the refrigerator door open well, that, one time when the, uh, you know, the leftover pizza from the night before was supposed to be chilling. Yeah. And, in the, uh, the the Senate coffee shop or something like, like that. C- Cicero put his name on the box. Correct. And he filched it. Yeah, and yes. Sal is, oh, I, I could take this. This looks <laughs> right. like a good lunch. Right. You know, That was enough. You're out of here. Yep. yep. So yep. some kind of moral turpitude. He's kicked out of the Senate. Mm-hmm. Uh, then, of course, he sides with Caesar because he could smell which way the wind was blowing. Yeah. Is that the right expression? I think he could smell what the rock was cooking. Isn't that the, the, the wrestling phrase? I don't phrase? know that at oh, all. So let's just move on. Okay. <laughs> He could sense which way the wind was blowing, so he sides with Caesar. Caesar wins, as we all know, and uh, he gets promoted uh, to a praetorship in 46. Okay, so that's that's well up the ladder from a, a quaestorship. It is. You're, yes. you're coming near the top, right? The top, of course, is the consul. Yes. And at one point, you get to sit in the curial chair. I've always wanted to do that. Yes, yeah. and uh, you get to wear a certain color of toga which uh, with a stripe, which was not uh, permitted to guys further down on the rung. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Pompeians, right, these would be, um, what, Sextus Pompey, uh, Pompey's son, they're still going strong in uh, Spain. They're still trying to uh, nip at Caesar's heels, you might say. And uh, Sallust is sent to Africa. Yes. He goes down there and becomes, uh, well, he's, he's a governor of the province right. for quite some time. Yes. Mm-hmm. And there he bumps into the, the Numidian kingdom and, of course, the very famous figure of Juba. Mm-hmm who had been on the side of the Pompeians. But Conte right. tells us that he, um, he wasn't very good at this job. Well, I don't know by whose standards that would be judged, because this was kind of um, de jour for Roman uh, magistrates. You make a career in the city, and then you get dispatched to the province, and you just steal it blind, right? That was just kind of expected. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. 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 It's, uh, I mean, if I can draw an analogy, it probably alienates some listeners, but you enter American politics, right? You leave it, and then you cash in on all of the business uh, relationships that you created while you were in office. Right. You get you the know. book deal, the speaking fees. Right. Yeah. And you sit on the board of some very large corporation. Yes. And it's, it's not, um, you're not technically doing anything wrong, but you're clearly capitalizing on, you know, your access to power previously. Indeed. And yeah. this is what Salas did. Mm. So uh, very famously, Cicero goes against uh, Verres, right, in one of his earliest speeches, because Verres was doing the same sort of thing in Sicily. Right. Uh, robbing them blind. So Sallust accused of embezzlement, right, for what he did in Africa. And uh, Conti tells us to avoid a condemnation, right, a sentence, and a second expulsion from the Senate, another pizza box incident. Uh, Caesar probably advised him, get out of public life once for all. Hmm. Hmm. And it's after that, then he becomes the author that we know him as. Right. Okay. And had he not been expelled from public life, his name would have been probably just a footnote because he's not one of the big dogs. Right. He's not a Crassus, not, a, not even a Cicero or a Clodius or a Milo. He's, he's a fairly minor figure. Mm-hmm. But he retreats from public life. And then what does he do? He, he writes. He writes history. Right. And uh, we're not going to get into this today because we're going to focus on sections 6 through 13. But in the beginning, he makes the standard apology for why he is writing history, not making history. Ah, yes. Yes, yes. This yes. is a really important turning point for the Romans because they had a strong predilection for the active life. Yeah. And we'll see that even in this, these, Definitely. These, the section we're talking about today. Yeah, yeah. So the kinds of things that you and I do for a living, you know, the Romans would not have given us the time of day. Oh, we would not. We wouldn't have lasted a, a week. No. No. <laughs> Because we're not actually doing anything. We just talk about stuff. We would be much more at home in Athens. Yes. Yes, absolutely. A litigious, argumentative, <laughs> contemplative society. Yes. The Romans would have looked upon us with disgust. Right. So you, you just read about the accomplishments of others, and then you talk about them and tell other people. Yeah, yeah. That, 
that's our shtick. Right. So, are you fine with Roman disgust for yourself and and their disgust for me? I'm well? fine with their disgust for you. Okay, but, but uh, yeah, it's taken time to make <laughs> some peace in my mind mm. between the the allure of the active life and the allure of the contemplative life. Right. And I think this is also reflective of what probably certainly by this time it had already become kind of this broad stereotype about Greeks and Romans. Correct. Romans are, are doers. They'll build you a, a sewer system and a road. And destroy Carthage. Destroy Carthage, that kind of stuff. Well, the Greeks will kind of wander through groves and, 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 and think and ponder. Yes, it's very different. Right. A counter argument to that characterization, though, is that many of what we would consider white collar jobs in Rome were held by Greeks. Oh yeah. Good point. Yeah. Um, doctors, dentists, things like that. They were held by Greek slaves who often had a better education than their Roman masters. Mm-hmm. And they were involved in some aspects of professional life, you might say. Yeah. And as, as I was reading this, I was also reminded that Plutarch, uh, you know, his, his lives that right. he writes, he pairs a, a kind of a philosophical Roman with a more a doer Greek right. in a way to kind of counter this this stereotype. Yes, yep. to uh, try to undermine it a little bit. So from that moment on, Conti tells us, from the time that he retired from politics, sometime before the death of Caesar, so prior to 44, uh, he devoted himself to historical writing. Died in either 35 or 34, so that would have made him 52, maybe he's yeah. 52 years old. And only a kind of a 10-year writing career. Right. It's not a lot of time. Yeah, but he, in those 10 years, he wrote his name across the sky, you might say. Yeah, and we've talked about how, you know, life being nasty, brutish, and short, Mm -hmm. these guys are motivated to cram it in. Correct. Yep. So just to sum up then, what he wants to try to do is say, my retirement from an active life is actually a good thing because I'm now going to write history. Mm. It's just as good. Gotcha. And Cicero has the same kind of impulse, right? Yeah. No distinguished military career, yep. a speaker of words, not a doer of deeds. So when he retires and writes philosophy, he gives these uh, defenses or these apologies for writing philosophy. It's, it's un-Roman. It's un- yeah, un-Roman, exactly. So, and then we're, we're coming down to the... We're getting close. We're getting close. To, but the, To the break, you're saying. Not to the break, actually, to the part that annoys me. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so as Conti tells us that when Salas died, he died in his luxurious residence... You got, its, you got a problem with that? Bear with me. Okay. With its large park loca- located between the Quirinal and the Pincian uh, hills, uh, leaving his work unfinished. So uh, m- the, the axe that I have to grind is mm-hmm. that, you know, in these, these chapters that we're talking about, he, he fulminates against the, the, the love of luxury. Yes. And how the it, avarice, the extravagance. How it just kind of, it just kills the morality mm-hmm. uh, of the Roman. And so it always tweaks me when... We have writers, be it, you know, poets, musicians, uh, taking kind of this tack, and then we see where they live, right? Celebrities with their fancy shoes. Exactly. With their, yeah, exactly right. So he lived in uh, the Horti Salustiani, yes. the gardens of Salus. Right. And you're bothered that even though he was fabulously wealthy, yes. he complains about the luxury of others. That bothers you? I think that like the whole you know, charges of hypocrisy get thrown around way too much. And as a way of kind of shutting down an argument, but I will just say this does bother me a little bit. It, 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 you know, I read this; it reminded me of uh, John Lennon's "Imagine," yes, which I would argue is in the top five worst songs of all time. Really, I hate it. Everybody loves no, it. No, they do not. It, oh, it, maybe they do, but I hate it. I hate how it's become kind of the syrupy, kind of humanist anthem. It's awful. It's sad. And when he's singing, isn't it? "Imagine no possessions," right? I wonder if you can. <laughs> You know, and he's writing this on his white grand piano, probably in the penthouse of the Dakota, New York City. That it, that bugs me. It rings hollow. It does. Right. Fair enough. We don't need to dig into your life a little bit and look for inconsistencies between professed principles and uh, practical. No, we won't be doing that at all. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly, we wouldn't want to say that Sallust is the only individual of antiquity or the present time whose uh, life and principles don't match up. I was just raising a small issue and we can move past it. It bugs me and I'm just going to leave it at that. Okay. All right. You're not going to allow me to engage with it. We just. I'm not, I'm not saying that Salas is like the only guy to do this. Right. But it's irritating. Hmm. It's irritating. Yeah. Uh, people who kind of, you know, point the fingers and kind of scream from their, the balconies on their, uh, from their mansions and, and, and scream about luxuries and moral turpitude. Come on. 
Right. Really? You wouldn't be thinking about a, a recent instance of this with uh, the revival of that Imagine song by Lennon where a bunch of celebrities at the outbreak of COVID. Oh, that was doubly awful. That bothered you a lot. What? St- stuck in your craw. It, well, it didn't bother me. I just thought it was it was just a supreme eye-rolling moment. Mm-hmm. And, and it confirmed everything that I just said. Mm. Right? Okay. And I felt, about that, I felt that way, Let the Breakfast Show, about that song long before Will Ferrell... And Wonder Woman. Gal Gadot, right. Yeah, it uh, did their thing. Okay, well, we'll leave it there. All right. So let's talk about a monograph. Please. Before we get to the break. Okay, I know, as I understood it, I mean, you sent this this to me, and this is a a question that you wanted to raise. And so what is a monograph? Well, I mean, to my mind, a monograph, well, it's it's just a book-length treatment of something. Yes. Why do we need to get into the details about this? Well, I think it's because the monograph is now the regnant genre. Nothing can compete with it. It's it's the top of the heap. It is. Okay. The encyclopedic treatment of something has completely fallen out of favor. So that's kind of the key distinction you're making there. Yes. Monograph versus encyclopedic. Yes, or extended, uh, brief. Uh, by brief, I mean um, shallow, right? Uh-huh. Uh, how do I put this? Instead of writing something that spans centuries and gives the reader a, a brief... Um, introduction, not very deep, but extensive, you might say, uh, of the content, the monograph where you take one tiny little theme and you drill down deep into it. Mm. This is what people uh, on the whole prefer, I think, very much, at least those who read nonfiction. Gotcha. That's interesting. Yeah. So here's an example. Uh, Anthony Grafton, uh, the famous Renaissance scholar, Mm -hmm. wrote A History of the Footnote. Oh, have you read this book? I have. Yeah? Yes. Would you recommend it? I would. It is really quite fascinating. I think it's maybe 140 pages, 150 pages. But if you want to know everything about the footnote, you read this book. Yeah. So when you finish it, you have kind of the uh, impression that you are now an expert in that tiny little area of human knowledge. This is what the monograph gives people. Mm, Okay. Uh, okay, I think okay. we can see this in other genres of uh, media consumption, right? You're a fan of true crime. I am. Right. So you might read a book on uh, the the murders in Perugia, right, with yeah. uh, Amanda Knox. Yes. So rather than, you know, doing a 12-volume study of forensic science where they just mention a couple examples here and there, you want to read something about that particular murder, Right. Ah, yes. Okay. That drills down deep into all the facets, and you walk away feeling hmm. like I'm kind of an expert, right? I've I've learned everything that this author has to offer on this particular subject. That's the monograph. Gotcha. Right. I I would see that also in film too. Like, yes. Like kind of I think like the rise of the documentary genre. Correct. As as being kind of a visual monograph of of sorts. Yes, right? definitely. Yeah. And think about the appeal of titles and so forth in terms of specificity. Mm-hmm. Right? If you're watching a nature documentary, if the title is something like uh, uh, animal life on the savanna, it's maybe not going to be quite as appealing because it's too broad. Hmm. What is there to catch someone's interest as opposed to something like, you know, the the secret nocturnal habits of lions? Yeah, I'd watch that. I would too. That yeah, sounds great. Yeah. Because it's so specific. You have the sense of, I can really master this little portion of this area of knowledge. I think that's I think that's part of the appeal. I, th- I really like that point because I think there's a lot of truth to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you become kind of in. Correct. Yeah. You, you enter the literary circle. Yes, yeah. After all, it's the premise of this podcast, isn't it? Yeah, indeed. I mean, we didn't start out with, you know, episode one, the classics, episode two, the classics, part two. Right. Right. <laughs> Each episode has a monograph kind of um, feel to it. So now is your sense that it's the Sallust for the Romans because yes. it invents the monograph? Yes. Or it starts here? Uh, it, starts it starts here. here. Okay. It, um, Sallust invents it. So Sallust is often compared. I like the way you brought it back around to the subject. <laughs> Sallust is often compared to Thucydides. Mm. Conti says that's a stretch. Uh, he's no Thucydides, right? He's not even Dan Quayle. But <laughs> Thucydides, eight books on the Peloponnesian War. So the Peloponnesian War, that's a monograph. It's not like Herodotus. So Herodotus, ostensibly about the Greco-Persian War, but Herodotus throws everything into the mix. It is, and the kitchen sink. Correct. Yep. You, you have a whole book on Egypt. you got a whole book on Scythia. What do these have to do with it's it? It's great, but where is it coming from? Exactly. <laughs> it's absolutely interesting because he's such a wonderful storyteller, but it's not a monograph. Gotcha, gotcha. So this is uh, this is the ungibbon, right? The decline and mm. fall of the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. What are you going to go on for? I don't know how many volumes, how many centuries? Yeah. Just give us 
one tiny little interesting uh, episode. And that's what Salas does. He, yeah. he gives us uh, Catalan's War. And I, I think it's also got to be related to this when Salas is, is living and working, that um, that kind of Calimachus ideal of yes. you know, uh, big book, big evil. Right? Yes. So and then polish it down. Definitely. Yeah. And the name for that, as we know, is the Neoteric movement. Right. So at this very time in Roman uh, poetry, there are individuals like Catullus, contemporary of mm-hmm. Sallust, and uh, Cicero names all those young guys Neoterics, right? The new guys. And what are they doing? They're taking um, the Alexandrian uh, literary um, preference, which you just mentioned, the Callimachus, and they're applying it to Roman literature. Yeah. Away with the big books. Let's let's deal in a precious way. Yeah. With just one little thing after another. I I, I certainly understand kind of the the appeal of that. Yes, yeah. I do too. Now I got to say also that I'm, I've read Thucydides in Greek and Sallust uh, in mm-hmm. his original Latin. Give me Sallust any day of oh. the week. Thucydides is extraordinarily oh, it's, it's difficult. Really, really hard. Yes, yeah. I read some in grad school. I've read the majority of it in English. This past year was the first time I taught Thucydides. In oh, Greek. How, how did that go? It was a challenge yeah. uh, for me as well as the students. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Salus is much easier, but he's trying to imitate some Thucydidean uh, stylistic elements, hmm. which we can talk about briefly later on. But in terms of your own um, your own media consumption, yeah. Doctor Winkle. Yes. Um, monograph. Um, definitely. What, what monograph. kinds of things are you reading and watching now, and do they fit this monograph genre? I, you know, it's, it makes me actually think of what I'm, I'm listening to. Okay. You know, like the the kind of songs that I that I like, the, or like lyrics that I like, tend to be very specific. Yes. Like I love it when a songwriter will mention streets. Okay. You know, and something happening in a particular neighborhood, and it suddenly just kind of sucks you in. And I always kind of compare it to it's it's like you're reading this person's journal or diary, mm-hmm. and you feel this kind of this very intimate connection with that person rather than, than some kind of broad, stupid song about falling in love. Right. I think that the, the monograph... That has no names, exactly. no dates, no places. Right. It might have a catchy, poppy tune behind it. Right. But give me that specificity any day of the week. So, yeah. I, yeah, um, I see it, my preference there kind of across media. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would say I'm the same. It, like what? Give me an example. Well, right, uh, right now I'm um, reading a book on. Um, it's called "Debating the Sacraments," so it's about 16th century. It's written by a friend of mine, uh, Amy Nelson Burnett, and the the theme or the you know the thesis is that the rise of the printing press affected all of the theological arguments in 1525 and 1526. Hmm. So. That's really specific. Yeah. Right? And one of the reasons I'm drawn to it is because there's a hole in my knowledge, right? I mean, there are so many, but when you when you consume something that's a monograph, you have the impression, it may be false, but you have the impression that you've plugged that hole, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so now I know that. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. I, I know that. I've, I've got that. Right. Um, I, I guess maybe my motivation then is a little bit different. Maybe it's not so aesthetically pleasing as it is giving a perhaps even a false sense of confidence. Yeah, yeah. That book sounds really interesting. It is fascinating. I love arguments that kind of point to some technological yep. um, kind of revolution and how it, kind of, it ripples out into so many different areas, mm-hmm. right? Well, we were talking before this episode started, but we're getting far afield here, aren't we? <laughs> we were talking before we began recording about uh, Ross King, yes. right? Yeah. And uh, the set of books he's re- uh, written that we've read, um, Brunelleschi's Dome, mm-hmm. Monograph, um, what was the other one? Michelangelo and the Pope's Ceiling. Yes, the Pope's Ceiling about Great Michelangelo. Book. There's a monograph. Right now I'm reading Leonardo and the Last Supper. Boom, there's a monograph. There's a monograph. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then there was uh, The Judgment of Paris about um, the rise of Impressionism. Yeah, in... I, haven't, I haven't gotten to that one. No. Yet. Yeah. But of course, uh, we're going to get to the break in a second. But what occurs to me is that these books, they have an ostensible theme which is how Michelangelo painted the ceiling. But you could tell that story in, you know, maybe 30 pages. Mm -hmm. So the artful monograph weaves into the rest of it, you know, the broader history of Florence, the history of painting, the history of the Pope, the history of ceilings, so on and so forth. One tiny little thing. But Salas is going to do something similar. It's Catalyne's War. He's going to give us the backstory of all of Roman history. And we'll get into that after the break. Today's episode is brought to you by Hackett Publishing. Now, Dave, I know you've been in that situation 
where all you want to do is sit on the back porch during a nice, wonderful, warm day like we're having here, near or under your favorite tree, thumb through something like Lucretius or Aristophanes, but all you can find is some horrible, musty translation with a brown cover, and the translation is stuffed with wills these thousand wherefores. That happens to me, Jeff. Yeah. Almost every day. Every day, man. <laughs> well, what can we do about it? Well, Hackett has changed all that. Listeners, with the click of a button, you can be on your way to discovering Hackett's deep well of attractive, affordable, accessible translations from the entire sweep of the Greco-Roman era. Great stuff for the academic as well as the casual reader. New books coming out all the time. For example, Hackett just released Len Kresak's new translation of Virgil's Aeneid, which we will get to at some point. For sure. Yep. And we should mention that their publications are not just classical translations. They offer a wide variety of commentaries, works on religion, political theory, philosophy. They have a really successful uh, version of Descartes' Meditations. Mm. I mean, it's used in, I think, universities and colleges all across the country. This is a wonderful English translation. And they even have AP Latin test preparation. That's excellent, but why should our listeners care? Well, ad nauseanators, right now you can save, you ready for this, 20% on any order and receive free shipping from Hackett Publishing. All you have to do is go to Hackett Publishing, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, publishing.com, find the text you want, enter the code A-N, that's ad nauseum, A-N-2021, in the box, which asks for the coupon code, don't wait. This episode is also brought to you by Racial Coffee. Ladies and gentlemen, listen closely, please. Mark Helweg and his team in Portland, Oregon, have solved all of your coffee-based problems. Why spend an exorbitant amount on coffee purchased in some drive through when you can brew better coffee at home? The Racial 6 and its big brother, the 8, these are beautiful automatic pour-over machines that consistently brew the finest java. That's right, Dave. The ratio sends 200 degree Fahrenheit water soaring through its metallic veins, no plastic in this creature, down into the cone filled with freshly ground ad astra beans. It then sits in the bloom stage for a few minutes, allowing all of the harsh CO2 to float lazily off into the biosphere, and then it is deposited in the hand-blown borosilicate glass or stainless steel carafe. No bitterness, no burned flavor, just consistent sweet coffee. That's right. Listen up, coffee files. Go to ratiocoffee.com right now, R-A-T-I-O coffee.com, and get a 15% exclusive discount on the Ratio 6. That's the one you have, Jeff, right? Yes, love it. And you love it. It brews such consistent sweet coffee. Enter special code AN, that's ad nauseum, A-N-C-O, A-N-C-O for 15% off the Ratio 6. Check it out. This week's episode is also brought to you by Ad Astra Coffee. The coffee that takes you to the stars, but doing an end run around that awful Per Aspera part. That's right. Up and at them. We are thrilled to have Ad Astra Roasters on board here at Ad Nauseam Specialty Coffee, veteran owned out of Hillsdale, Michigan, just a couple of short hours away from the vomitorium. The fine people at Ad Astra have been roasting beans for years, at first just for themselves, but now their high quality bed and drum roasted goodness is available for everyone. As owner Patrick Whelan puts it, our goal is to create extraordinary quality in the cup value for our producers and customers, and strong local communities. That's correct. Huehuetenango. Yeah, Tenebris. Tenebris. Good stuff. Las Lajas Micro Lot. <laughs> Femenino from Guatemala. All of these delicious coffees you can get at adastraroasters.com. Go to their website, A-D-A-S-T-R-A roasters.com, and enter our special coupon code. What is that, Dr. Winkle? Uh, A-N-A-A. Yes, and then they get 10% off their order. Yes, and they can also sign up for a monthly subscription. Check it out. All right, let's get into uh, a bit of the Bellum Catalini uh, proper. And so again, like we said, we're going to cover chapters 6 through 13, hopefully. And you're going to start us off, Dave, with reading a little Latin. Yes, I am. This okay. is from the Loeb edition. Uh, the translator and the editor is Rolf, R-O-L-F-E. And uh, this is in the public domain now, so all of you uh, lovers of Latin history and so forth can go check it out. And this is what he says in chapter 6. Urbem Romam sicuti ego ac capi condidere atque habuere initio Troiani, qui Aenea duce profugi, sedibus incertis vagabantur, cumque eis aborigenes genus hominum agreste, sina legibus, sina imperio, liberum atque solutum. Can I give the translation for Let's that? Hear Let's that, hear that, please. This is from, this is Rolf. 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 Translates thusly, the city of Rome, according to my understanding, was at the outset founded and inhabited by Trojans, who were wandering about in exile under the leadership of Aeneas, and had no fixed abode. They were joined by the Aborigines, or rustic folk, without laws or government, 
free and unrestrained. Yes. Fascinating. Yep. So again, we see here all of the common elements of the Roman legendary and mythological beginning. It was Trojans and it was Aeneas, right? This, mm -hmm. this lovely um, ablative absolute here, Aenea Duca, with Aeneas as their leader. And then we graft onto that Trojan stock, the Aborigines, yes. the Italian peoples, kind of unnamed, really. Mm -hmm. uh, in this text, Aborigines is, um, is capitalized, but it just really means the people who were living there. Right. And we don't know what their background is. Right. And I find it so fascinating that Sallust mentions them as a rustic people, right? They're genus agreste. This is kind of the myth of the noble savage, mm -hmm. right? Exactly they, right. They yep. are sine legibus. They got no laws. Sine imperio. They got no uh, government, but they just live free and unencumbered, Libra Matqua Salutum. So this is Odysseus um, and coming to the Cyclops Island all exactly. over again, except it has a happy ending. Right. So I think this is so interesting. Again, it's the, the Trojans are coming. They're bringing the civilization. The Aboriginal people, the uh, original peoples of the Italian boot, they bring the nature side. Correct. And they come together, and there's kind of this really nice, as he goes on to write, kind of this e pluribus unum moment. Well said. Yeah. Yes, which I believe Al Gore translated as uh, from one many. From one many. <laughs> That's what he, if memory serves. <laughs> If any of our listeners are very loyal to, you know, early 2000s uh, democratic politics, they are now forever alienated. But I know. Well, that's the risk you take. I guess. After these two peoples, Rolf goes on, different in race, unlike in speech and mode of life, were united within the same walls. They were merged into one with incredible facility. So quickly did harmony change a heterogeneous and roving land into a commonwealth. Yeah. It's the cliff notes of of uh, the earliest of, of Roman history. Definitely. Right now, it, if you've read the Aeneid, of course, there's there's lots of bloodshed that takes place. Oh, it's not as easy as Sallust makes it sound. Right. He's, 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 he's skipping over mm -hmm. a lot of stuff, but I was amazed by the, the amount of stuff that he, he crammed into these it's seven chapters. It's very compact. Yeah. yeah. So the very end of this sentence is just uh, concordia quibitas facta erat. With harmony, a state was formed. That's it. Now we're going to see the standard degeneration Right. It's going to go downhill from this auspicious beginning. It's like the, uh, the ages of men. That's in, what it reminded me of, too. In Hesiod exactly. or, or Ovid. He gets very Hesiodic as he goes through this, Definitely. this passage. Yeah. So here, as we wrap up uh, chapter six, there's a little bit of a note here that I think is important about the monarchy. Hmm. He says, uh, later, when the rule of the kings, which at first had tended to preserve freedom and advance the state, had degenerated into a lawless tyranny, they altered their form of government and appointed two rulers with annual power. These would be the... The consuls. The consuls. Mm -hmm. So this is 509 BC, uh, when the Tarquins are thrown out of Rome. We've got a Brutus and Calatinus, right? Yeah. Famous story of the rape of Lucretia. And this is right around the same time the Athenians are beginning their experiment with a, a democracy. That's correct. Right? Yep. So it's after the Pisistratids. They're kind of going back to what Solon had set up. And so I've always wondered, strange coincidence that the Roman um, establishment of a republic or a democracy kind of coincides yeah. with the Athenian time. Mm -hmm. So they did this thinking that this device, right, the consulate, would prevent men's minds from growing arrogant through unlimited authority. Right, so the consul would hold power for a year to kind of constant turnover. The, uh, the ideal was to prevent someone um, becoming authoritarian. That's right. And they had joint veto you know, right. both consuls, kind of like here in the vomitorium, right? <laughs> I want to do something, but you want to do something else. Yeah. We both have to agree on it before it gets done. That's right. So in effect, nothing ever gets done. Exactly. It gets ugly. <laughs> it does. Yeah, right. So they call it, uh, Salus' phrase here is per licentium, right? Uh, unlimited authority, per licentium, mm. just absolute license. Mm -hmm. So now we go on to chapter seven as he continues to develop this. And he talks about the thirst for glory, I think this is the phrase that Rolf uses. Can you read a little bit about that? How is it that the thirst for glory leads to the further degeneration of the Roman state? My pleasure. So the beginning of chapter seven. Now at that time, every man began to lift his head higher and to have his talents more in readiness. For kings hold the good in greater suspicion than the wicked. And to them, the merit of others is always fraught with danger. Still, the free state, once liberty was won, waxed incredibly strong and great in a remarkably short time. Such was the thirst for glory that had filled men's minds. Hmm. So we have a number of nobles competing with one another because they want to uh, achieve this gloria, right? It's a tanta cupido gloria is what uh, Salas says. They have this strong desire for personal distinction 
and that drives the state along. And um, it, it at first is a good thing. It's a positive thing, but it soon goes awry, doesn't it? Do you, do you think that the Gloria here is, is a, co- a corollary to Arate? Is it, I mean, is yes. there is overlap here? I think that'd be a good way to translate yeah. it. But Salas sees the danger in, um, in going too far. Yes, right? excess. Excess, hubris. So you can't yeah. really say this is Stoic, but the Roman uh, Mos Maiorum, right, the tradition of the ancestors, is very consonant with Stoicism mm-hmm. uh, writ large. So we go on then through seven, and uh, he talks about their desire for praise, their desire for riches, just a little bit of the, um, of the Latin here, laudis awidi pecuniae liberales erderant. They wanted praise, but they were generous with their money. Mm. So these are some of the antitheses that Sallust is developing as he talks about the early Romans. What they really wanted was distinction. Yeah, they had money but they weren't obsessed with it. Yes. It didn't really drive their action. Right. And so the, the, the virtues of this era is, is military valor. Mm-hmm. He, he talks in this chapter, he talks about um, men would compete for being kind of the, the first over the wall, so to speak. Exactly. Um, and so, yes, there's value in those things like riches, um, uh, but it's what you do with them. It's how you respond to them. Again, very stoic. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, that's what, that's what matters. Yep. And at the end of seven, we have this nice little praetor itio, mm. right? Which mm-hmm. is, I'm not going to mention this, but I'm going to mention it by not mentioning it. It's right? kind of annoying, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I might name the battlefields on which the Romans with a mere handful of men routed great armies of their adversaries. We'll do it. And the cities fortified by nature, which they took by assault. Were it not that such a theme would carry me too far from my subject. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So it's, it's deft. This is how the monograph works, right? Yeah. I could describe all of the history of Florence, but it's not really germane to how Leonardo painted, you know, The Last Supper. So I'll just mention a couple I got things. you. Okay. I see what he's doing here. Yeah. yeah that, okay. That's what he does. Good. So then we take an interesting turn in chapter eight, don't we? Right. He starts talking about fortune. He starts talking about fortune and the Athenians. Yes. 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 We get some of that difference, uh, that uh, kind of stereotypical differences between the Greeks and Romans we were talking about. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so read a little Latin from this, from this passage. Okay, so he says, Sed quia provenera ibi scriptorum magna ingenia per terrarum orbem Ateniensium facta pro maximis celebrantur. Mm. And that translates to, but because Athens produced writers of exceptional talent, the exploits of the men of Athens are heralded throughout the world as unsurpassed. Yes. So what we see here, thank you, Jeff, very nicely done. We see here is the contrast between the Roman sense of we're doers Mm -hmm. and the Athenians are the writers, right? Yes. There's a sense of cultural inferiority that the Romans are always trying to combat. Yeah. Encapsulated in the famous Horatian tag, right, about um, Rome took Greece captive and then was captured by Greece in a cultural sense. Right. I, I find that in teaching mythology... There's, uh, my students will often have this kind of facile understanding that, uh, oh, the Romans just took the Greek gods and changed their names. Right. And there's some broad truth to that. Um, I think it kind of ignores a lot of kind of the aboriginal parts that remain in, in the Roman culture. Yes. But this idea that Romans felt as kind of in second place mm-hmm. in terms of Greek culture is very, very true. Absolutely. It's a chip on their shoulder. Yeah, we can talk about it as a kind of uh, accent fallacy. Maybe we've even mentioned it on the air before. I don't know. If you hear something spoken with a British accent, <laughs> if an American does, yes. it immediately has authority. Yes, exactly. That's a great uh, comparison. Even though, you know, it's just said in a different way. But with a British accent, it, you know, must be important. It sounds erudite. Correct. Yes. So that's what the Romans thought about the Greeks. So then Sallust goes on and he gives kind of an excuse. How come we didn't produce any great writers, any great historians or artists? He says, but the Roman people never had that advantage since their ablest men were always most engaged with affairs. We were too busy building and conquering to, you know, write any great works of art, he says, in effect. Their minds were never employed apart from their bodies. The best citizen preferred action to words and thought that his own brave deeds should be lauded by others rather than that theirs should be recounted by him. I'm seeing you know, a, a lot of um, Americanism Definitely. on these pages. But that kind of that, the, the ideal of the, the practical American. Yes. Right? Uh, Americans build things. Right. right? Uh, I, I hear it when you know, you know, constant debates on opinion pages about 
what kids should major in. Oh, for sure. Right. It, it, this is the heart of that very, You're right. very thing. Right. So, you know, you, you major in something practical. It's like in the graduate, um, you know, going to plastics. Yeah. You know, the guy tells Dustin Hoffman, I don't know that you haven't seen the graduate. <laughs> no, I haven't. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. A, I'm, I'm a Philistine, but any, right. anyway, this is Alexis de Tocqueville coming to America mm-hmm. in the 1840s yeah. and saying these Americans, you know, they're so practical, right? The, they really aren't interested in literature and philosophy. They're just, they're just practical. It's a kind of a, um, a survey of Roman life. Now, the Romans did produce great authors like mm-hmm. Sallust, whom we're reading, but it was always in some ways contrary to the Roman spirit, yeah. you might say. Yeah. So what happens next then in chapter nine? Now we're going to get some good morals, right? Can you, can you read a little portion of that? Sure. Um, from the beginning of chapter nine. Accordingly, good morals will cu- were cultivated at home and in the field. There was the greatest harmony and little or no avarice. Justice and probity prevailed among them, thanks not so much to laws as to nature. Quarrels, discord, and strife were reserved for their enemies. Citizen vied with citizen only for the prize of merit. Hmm. Now, what do you think Sallust intends for his, his audience here? Because like, that, to me, that strikes me. I mean, I'm just cynical, but that's, I mean, that's syrupy. And he's, he's painting with this very broad, brightly colored brush. Yeah. So and did, um, no did, avarice really <laughs> did George Washington chop down the, the cherry tree? Well, no, of course he didn't. Okay. So are we supposed to believe that these aspects of early Romans are true? I don't know what Salas himself thinks about this. I guess maybe he believes it. And he's, again, he's setting up a small part of a, of a larger work here, but, uh, I guess maybe he's just saying to his audience, yeah, you, you know, these things, this is where we were and this is how far we've come. And he's just, he's just, he's being compact for the sake of, of being compact. Yeah. For the monograph. Yeah. For the monograph. Okay. So now we go on to chapter 10. Mm. Yeah. Now things are starting to get bad. Yes, they are. Yeah. And I'd like to read a little bit of the Latin here. Please do. Sed ubi labora atque justitia res publica crevit. Reges magni bello domiti nationis ferai et populi ingentes vi subactae. Cartago aemula imperi romani. And I'll take the translation. That'd be great. That's right. Um, But when our country had grown great through toil and the practice of justice, when great kings had been vanquished in war, savage tribes and mighty peoples subdued by force of arms, when Carthage, the rival of Rome's sway, had perished root and branch, and all seas and lands were open, then fortune began to grow cruel. So this is the turning point in Sallust's archaeology, literary archaeology of Roman history. Rome went too far. It's interesting that he, he talks in this passage about about you know uh, early virtues were you know piety uh, for the gods, but fortuna, 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 kind of fickle fortune. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the the wheel can turn at any moment, um, and so there's really no kind of talk about the gods here. It's just that fickle fortune mm-hmm. um, starts things on a downturn. Definitely. Yeah. And so then in chapter ten we get the the most sustained critique of this transformation of early Roman values and morals. Yeah. He said, uh, you know, they started out with this wonderful endowment of virtue where they fought for distinction and not for power. Mm. But now all of these other things come in. Avaritia, right? Greed, superbia, haughtiness, crudelitas, just a kind of savage brutality toward others. And then, uh, to your point, here there is the Deus Neglegera. They started to neglect oh, the yeah. gods, right, right? right? They started to abandon uh, religion. I also like this passage to, in this in the same chapter. Um, he writes, Ambition drove many men to become false, to have one thought locked in the breast and another ready on the tongue. That's He's got to be thinking of Achilles' phrase in the Iliad, where he says, Hateful to me is the man who says one thing and hides another in his heart. Yes. So, uh, um, Absolutely. Forthright, honest, you know, wear it on your sleeve, kind of Roman is gone. Yeah, no Everybody's more Everybody's got an ulterior motive now. Yes, yeah. yeah. Or the uh, the equally famous line from uh, Euripides Hippolytus, where Hippolytus says, well, you know, my tongue swore, yeah. uh, but my mind was silent. Yes, yes, This yes. is so un-Roman, you yeah. know, to be cunning. They're supposed to be just plain Cincinnatus kinds of persons. Yeah, you're, that, that cunning ideal is is not valued by no by the by in Roman virtue. Yeah, right. until this time, then they start to act in this venal fashion. Yep, and uh, so then the last lines here of uh, chapter ten, um, really, really quite nice, where he says, uh, "Imperium ex justissimo atque optimo crudela intolerandumque factum." 
the state was changed and a government second to none in equity and excellence, you know, so Rome was the very best, Mm -hmm. became cruel and intolerable. And then as we get into chapter 11, he finally starts to get specific and starts mm-hmm. naming names. Yes. And it's, uh, it's uh, Sulla that he, he zeroes in on as, as someone who really started uh, the landslide here. Yes. Yeah. Lucius Cornelius Sulla Felix. Felix. Lucky. Lucky guy. Yeah. Can you read a little bit of that from the Rolf? Sure. Um, this is in the middle of, the, of chapter 11 there. It says, but after Lucius Sulla, having gained control of the state by arms, brought everything to a bad end from a good beginning. All men began to rob and pillage. One coveted a house, another lands. The victors showed neither moderation nor restraint, but shamefully and cruelly wronged their fellow citizens. Mm. Again, he's, he's speaking in these absolutes. You know, at first, no avarice at all, and now all men are doing this. Right? Mm-hmm. So I, I think I see what he's up to. He's, he's painting a, he's painting a, a very stark picture uh, to make a very wide, broad point. Yes, and in literary terms, what I find fascinating about this is that these very broad, perhaps overgeneralized claims are within the context of a monograph. So if you're going to write about something very specific, Catiline's War, the Pope's Ceiling, Mm -hmm. you first have to set the stage with really large claims that may be impossible to prove. Yes. Before you get down to the nitty gritty. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. I also like how he brings up in this chapter about, and you see this this is also uh, amongst the Greeks as well, is... um, Vice, a lot of it's brought back from the East. Mm-hmm. So it's a Persian luxury. Yes. Remember that it's Dionysus who, uh, he's a Greek god, but he comes from the East mm-hmm. with his flowing locks and right. his, his indulgence in wine. The decadence and so, the yeah, the corruption of, of, uh, of, of luxuries. Yep. So then as we move into chapter 12, uh, it's now just going to be avarice and ambition all the time. All the time, right. And he gives a, a nice kind of... Um, Apostrophe. He speaks to the reader here, and he gives them uh, a way to understand how they can evaluate their current circumstances. Uh, Dave, uh, read a little bit for us uh, from that passage, would you? Okay. So he says, It is worth your while when you look upon houses and villas reared to the size of cities to pay a visit to the temples of the gods built by our forefathers, most reverent of men. They adorned the shrines of the gods with piety, their own homes with glory, while from the vanquished they took naught save the power of doing harm. The men of today, on the contrary, basest of creatures with supreme wickedness, are robbing our allies of all that those heroes in the hour of victory had left them. They act as though the one and only way to rule were to wrong. That's straight out of Hesiod's Iron Age. Yeah. No hope for this generation. Everything has degenerated. Right. What used to be considered virtue is now a vice. What used to be considered a vice is now a virtue. Right. And I think that's reflective of how, in some ways, you know, every generation complains about the one Oh, don't get it. me started on the millennials. Get the kids, do, the kids oh, these days? Oh, my goodness. Get off your lawn. <laughs> exactly. Right. Is it the millennials I'm supposed to resent? No, I think I'm, now it's Gen Z. We've I'm supposed on. to be upset at Gen, Gen Z? Z? yeah. Well, then I am upset. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> how dare they not live up to... What's our generation? We're X. We're X. Yeah. How dare they not live up to our standards? Exactly. Our... our slacking in our apathy. You speak for yourself. Okay. <laughs> but now I got, again, I got to call out Salast here. When you look upon houses and villas reared to the size of cities, he's writing from one of these. Yeah, so he's not perfect. Does that invalidate all of his moral critique? I just want a footnote, you, an you asterisk got, or something. Right? <laughs> Do you have to be morally perfect to criticize the values of others? You don't, but at least... What a, are you, a, a modern A winkle? little bit of self-deprecation, at least a, a self-awareness. In a monograph, doesn't that weaken, weaken his point? Wouldn't that just invite people to dismiss him? Uh, no, I, it's just, it's the rank hypocrisy. Okay, I, I, I almost rendered you speechless there. It's rank. <laughs> so let's sum it up then with chapter 13 yes. as we coast to the conclusion. Here at the end of the literary archaeology, before he turns to deal with the, the actual subject of the work, which is Catiline, he gives us a kind of summary of what's going on in his time. Can you read a little bit of that for us, please? I will, but let's hear some more Latin. Okay, this that. is the last bit for today. Sed lubido stupri, ganeae caterique cultus non minor in caeserat, virdri muliebri apati, mulieres pudicitiam in propatulo haberdre, vescendi causa terdre marique omnia exquirere, dormirdre prius quam somni cupido esset, 
non famam, famam aut sitem neque frigus, neque lassitudinem operiri, sed ea omnia luxu ante cupere. Ooh, it's heavy stuff here. That's great. Yeah, he's, he's, he's fist pounding here at the end. And it goes something like this. Nay, more, the passion which arose for lewdness, gluttony, and the other attendants of luxury was equally strong. Men played the woman. Women offered their chastity for sale. To gratify their palates, they scoured land and sea. They slept before they needed sleep. I'm certainly guilty of that. <laughs> they did not await the coming of hunger or thirst, of cold or of weariness. But all these things, their self-indulgence anticipated. Yeah. So they're just degenerate, totally degenerate by his time period. Right. And you don't find this entirely plausible. This is your footnote because Sallust is living in his palatial gardens. I'm not saying that what he's saying is not true. It's just, uh, it's a little irritating coming from this, from what we know about this guy. Okay, maybe this is the classic right word to turn. You familiar with this? No. You know the expression, I actually learned this from Peter Green, long, long, long ago, the famous historian. He's talking about Isocrates, Mm -hmm. Athenian uh, orator, contemporary of Plato. Isocrates, he said, made the classic right word turn. If when you're young, you're not progressive, you don't have a heart. If when you're old, you're not traditionalist, you don't have a brain. Mm. That is the cliche. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying it's true, it's false, but it's definitely a pattern of how people tend to behave, right? When they're young and carefree, they tend to be far more progressive and easygoing. When they get older and they've spent time acquiring property, accomplishing things, they become really protective in Mm. some ways of the things that they have. And so they make the classic right word turn. Okay. So maybe this is what has happened to Salas. He's Mm. He's a populist when he's young. Now that he's been through all of these things, he's seen some of the consequences of Caesar's program. Maybe he's a little bit chastened by being thrown out of the Senate once, almost twice. Now he becomes the grumpy old man yeah. and says, you know, what's going on with these youngsters? Mm. I, I like that. Okay, I'll buy that. Yeah. You, you ready to say, let the record show that, that no, he's correct here? I'm, I'm not going to go that far. I did I, that for you in the last you, episode. Uh, you did? Yeah, you don't remember. Check the transcript. No, I think I'm remembering that now. Okay, let the record show. That, okay. Okay. <laughs> so as we wrap this up then, yep. what's the takeaway here from chapter 13, as well as uh, the whole literary archaeology? Well, one question that, that struck me is that is, and I think it's a really interesting question, is that you know, in, at the beginning of this passage, Salas doesn't say that luxury in and of itself is wrong. But the uh, Im- important question becomes, uh, once a society becomes prosperous, how do you use that luxury? How do you stop luxury from corrupting your society? Every, every society wants to become rich and prosperous. Yes. But that comes with these inherent dangers. Yeah. So wealth, right? Luxury is the abuse of wealth. Yes. How do they use the wealth properly? I think he says earlier, we used it to adorn the temples of the gods. Mm, mm-hmm. We were satisfied at home if we just had a sense of achievement but now we've reversed things. Now the temples lie in ruins and our homes have become, you know, temples to ourselves, yeah. kind of. And was it, in an earlier episode, we were talking about prized possessions. Yes. And you had trouble coming Your up guitar. with... Your guitar. My guitar. And you had trouble coming up with one. Uh, the ashtray. The ashtray. But you, it took a, wh- a while to, to come around to that. Maybe I was being dishonest. Well, I, but I think that's... You were reflective. You're reflecting a, a Celestian ideal there. Oh, well, thank that's you. Right. You don't have a prized possession because possessions are, you know, they're not... The most important thing. I thought about it some more, though, um, after the episode. I tried to come up with some other things that I really do hold dear. Uh And I thought of a few others. I have a glass candy dish that was given to me by my mother. It's from my grandparents. But even though my grandparents, to my knowledge, knew nothing about the Greeks, this glass candy dish has a meander, right? The Greek key inscribed around the top of it. Yeah. That's valuable to me, too. Well, some of those objects are tied to... Family right. and your profession. I think right. those are things that Salas would be perfectly cool He'd with. He'd be okay? He would be. Well, right? like your guitar, that's your prized possession mm-hmm. because it's reflective of your identity. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's through which you know art can be produced, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's a tool for hopefully beautiful things. An extension of your soul? Yes. Is it going too far? No, not at all. Okay. Not at all. I like that. So we wrap up then. We're done with the literary archaeology. We mm-hmm. kind of skimmed through it, but we begin here, uh, chapter 14, just this one point. Intanta tam quae corrupta kiwitata Catalina. Right? So wh- what do we got there? In a city so great and so corrupt, Catiline. Ah. 
So Man. here now, this is the beginning. Oh, that's such a great... It, it is. That's a call me Ishmael line. <laughs> it that's is. So, it's so sharp. You can see Sallust's brilliance, right? Yeah. There is a little bit, actually, of alliteration. Corrupta, kiwitate, Catalina. He juxtaposes. He slams them together. Yeah. The state so corrupt, here he steps out on stage. Catalina. That's that'll, beautiful. That'll take us to the end of the monograph. And uh, now we're at the end of this episode. Now, Dave, before we get out of here, you had said you, you were going to say something about his style. Ah, right, right, right. How it contrasts with Cicero. Yeah. So Cicero has uh, notoriously long sentences. Some are short, but they're all kind of what's called round, right? Everything is balanced. There's a lot of symmetry and parallelism, subordination. Yeah. Sallust has a style called inconkinitas, which you could translate as something like jarring mm. or almost prickly. He likes to take one idea and slam it right next to another one in sharp contrast. So the sentences tend to be short. There's a lot of punch. There's a lot of um, surprise in the way he places the words. It's a very different style. In fact, some people like, um, you know, Dr. Watts, they strongly prefer Sallust to someone yeah. like Cicero. Maybe it's like uh, uh, he's doing something in a different time signature. It can it keeps you a little bit off balance. That is a very good analogy. Yeah. Something like, I don't know, 5 4 right. or something. Exactly. Yeah. Like a rush song. Right. And you, uh, I don't know. It's to me, I'm obviously Ciceronian yes. in my taste. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, but it, it's kind of makes me too uncomfortable. Maybe that's what he's after. Though. Oh, I think so. Yeah. So, Dave, what was Salas Nachleben, his afterlife? Yeah. So, again, we're going to go back to Conte, the man with whom we began. And we're going to give a little quote here from page 244. He says, Gradually, Salas came to be overshadowed by Tacitus as a psychologist, a dramatist, a theoretician of the absolute state, and as a stylist. Nowadays, he is scarcely read except by students of Latin. It's a shame. It is a shame. Yeah. Because it's so interesting, penetrating insight. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those of you who read Latin, this is brilliant Latin. It's very interesting. Good stuff. Hey, we got to get out of here. Why is that precisely? Well, uh, apparently the, uh, the International School of Dentistry, which is right above us, seems to be drilling through the ceiling uh, into into the uh, the mithraeum of the vomitorium down here. Yeah, right above us, right? Yes. I don't, hopefully the listener can't hear these long, grumbly, gurgly noises that are coming through. I don't know if they're pulling a tooth or inserting a tooth. It sounds like they're doing some kind of paleontological dig up there. <laughs> the... Well, let, let us assure the listeners, this is not our stomachs. If you hear this <laughs> low rumble, that's something else. That's right. That's right. So we want to thank Mishka Fernando, our intrepid sound engineer. Thank you so much. Yes. Thanks to Ken Tamplin and Scott Vinzen, who, who provide the wonderful music. It's ripping. Yep. Absolutely. And uh, Dave, tell us about the Moss Method before we... Sure, I can do here. that. Yep. So it is self-paced expert accessible it will take you from no knowledge of the greek language to lots of knowledge in a short time and inexpensively excellent go to mossmethod.com mossmethod.com also uh, dear listener please uh, subscribe leave a review at spotify or uh, apple itunes if you like the podcast send us email jeff at ad nauseum.com don't forget the v dave at ad nauseum.com you can also check out our merch if you'd like to We'd so appreciate it if you could pick up a nice classically themed t-shirt. Yeah, do it. Show the world that you're taking in and keeping down the classics. Jeff, what do we have for next week? Next week we are talking about, actually, I'm forgetting the guy's name. Daniel Heinzius. Heinzius. I, I didn't forget, I just didn't know how to pronounce it. Yeah, it's a Dutch Renaissance figure. Excellent. What, and what, what's his deal? Well, he wrote epigrams. Okay. Uh, he also wrote uh, works on tragedy, how to compose a tragedy. He wrote some hilarious epigrams. I was going to ask if he brings the funny. He does. These little uh, two-liners. He was a really incredible uh, scholar of the Dutch Renaissance. We're going to go all in on the Dutch Renaissance next week with Daniel Heinzius. Sounds great. And Jeff, you've got our gustatory parting shot. It does. I think it's the first time we're doing a song lyric. And this comes from one of my favorite bands, uh, Weezer. And this is from their song, Pork and Beans, which came out a few years ago. I'm going to do the things that I want to do. I ain't got a thing to prove to you. I'll eat my candy with the pork and beans. Excuse my manners if I make a scene. Ah, so a little bit of the, uh, you know, thumb in the face kind of thing. If he wants to eat candy Poke with pork and beans, he's going to do it. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.